Welcome to the second installment in my Reflection Seismology 101 series, Seismic Waves in a 3D Earth. The first video gave you a basic understanding of seismic waves. Now we learn how they propagate, bend, and reflect in a real 3D Earth. Here's a cartoon showing us firing a buried dynamite source into the ground and looking at the P wave after 0.1 seconds. The ground has several layers corresponding to different rock types. If you watch my previous video, what is a, is a seismic wave, then you know that the wavefront expands away from the source location in a spherical shape. Why is the wave field colored red and blue? Recall that when you move a mass sus suspended between two springs, the mass oscillates about its, about its equilibrium point. When a seismic energy source like dynamite hits a small cube of the earth, its neighbors act like springs, causing the cube to oscillate. The curve plots the displacement of a cube of Earth hit by the wave. We color code the positive parts of the curve blue and the negative parts red. The color codes give us a more convenient way to display the wave in three dimensions than by plotting lines. We call the color, quote, seismic amplitude, but it could represent several different things, pressure, particle displacement, or particle velocity. These details don't matter at this point. All that matters is we set off an explosion and the colors of the wave field tell us where the wave is and how strong it is. Now let's look at some real waves. The IRIS Consortium de deploys an array of seismometers called EarthScope across the United States. Each dot on this map is a seismometer. The video shows earthquake waves moving from an earthquake in Mexico across the array. At the surface, the waves are roughly circles expanding away from Mexico. Blue means that the ground moves up, red means that the ground moves down. It's no surprise that this real wave field looks a lot like our cartoon wave field. See the red line on the map? The ground motion panel shows the seismic amplitude as it moves along this line from south to north. It looks a lot like our simple spring example, and that's because Hooke's law is the basis of the wave equation. Pretty cool. Now let's look at the cartoon wave field after 0.2 seconds. Notice that the downgoing wave seems to have bounced at the layer boundary and is now moving up. In the previous video, we taped plastic and metal slinky together and saw a reflected wave from the boundary between the two slinkies, which had a different stiffness. The seismic reflection happens because the wave has passed a rock layer boundary and one rock is stiffer than the other. The bigger the change in stiffness across the boundary, the stronger the amplitude of the reflected seismic wave. The second strange thing you see is the stretching of the downgoing wave. It's no longer a sphere. The stretching effect is called refraction. Seismic waves travel at 2,000 meters per second in the top layer and 2,500 meters per second in the green layer. When the seismic energy enters the higher velocity rock, the part of the wave in the fast rock traveled further in 0.1 seconds than the part of the wave still inside the slow rock. Let's see refraction demonstrated in an everyday example. <clears throat> if you put a pen in a glass of water, the pen appears bent. It's actually straight, of course, and only appears bent. This optical illusion is caused by the refraction of light waves. Light travels faster through air than it does through water. The light bends at the air-water boundary. Your eye thinks that the object is further away than it really is. There's a really important physics concept called Snell's Law that governs how much bending happens. The bigger the difference in velocity between the layers, the more bending happens. Now I've added oil, which floats on top of the water. Instead of being bent once, the, bend, the pen is bent twice. The oil really bends the light. Light moves even slower in oil than it does in water. If you don't believe me, check out the zoom view to see the pen bent into three segments. The property that governs the amount of refraction is called the index of refraction. It's actually the inverse of velocity. The index of refraction of olive oil is closer to water than it is to air. This explains why the bending across the oil-water interface is less than the bending across the air-oil interface. So why do we care about Snell's Law? As you'll see in later videos, we want to understand how seismic energy gets from the source to some point underground and back to the surface. Here I show the wave field at 0.1 seconds and at 0.2 seconds. We want to understand 
how a piece of energy on the wavefront at 0.1 seconds evolves to reach the wavefront at 0.2 seconds. What would happen if there wasn't a second layer? Instead, assume that the wave field stays within a 2000 meter per second layer the whole time. The wave front would be spherical. Then it would be very easy to see how the wave field evolves as it propagates into the Earth. We can simply trace a perpendicular line from the wave front back to the source point. This bent yellow line shows how the wave field evolves as it propagates. But how did I draw it? Short answer, Snell's Law. It's a lot easier to use Snell's Law to trace a so-called ray than it is to answer this question by working with 3D wave fields. The ray concept will be used over and over again. If you've watched the first two videos, then you have what it takes to view the next video, which will describe how we record the seismic waves in order to accomplish the real goal, which is to use the reflected seismic waves to generate a 3D map of the sub subsur subsurface rock layers. Click on the link below to access the next video. And please hit like and subscribe if you want to get the latest content.